Our scripture, we've already had the um, Old Testament reading, which was our Ten Commandments. And the two additional readings that we're going to be using this morning is 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, and then John 2, 13 through 22. Hear the reading of God's word. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those who are being saved. It is the written in the scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the word world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs, and Greeks ask for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is the scandal to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than any human's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than any human strength. And then John two thirteen through 22. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the table of those who were exchanging currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you remember playing dress up? How many of us ever played dress up? I can see Pauline playing dress up. <laughs> Yes, definitely. <laughs> I think it's fun to watch kids play dress up, and they have usually something that they're going for. Shannon's thing was she was always a school teacher, and originally she had to have a blackboard, and then it went to the whiteboard, so she had to have a whiteboard. And then she also had to have a notebook to keep everybody's names in, and she would set her stuffed animals up, and she would teach them. Now, they would all get grades, and there were times that the Stuffed animals would get put in time out. Now, I don't know if you've ever had any misbehaving stuffed animals, but it's pretty rough. And um, so she knew, you know, to put them in time out. She knew how to make sure that their homeworks got done. And the funny thing is, she would sit there and do the homework for them. Lee's pretend thing was she had a friend named Phoebo. And it took me a long time to figure out who Phoebo was. And she kept saying, she's got beautiful blonde hair, and she's wearing this brown dress. And I thought, what in the world? And she kept talking about Phoebo and Phoebo and Phoebo, and I finally figured it out. Football. It has blonde hair and a brown dress, and that was her pretend friend. We all like pretending, don't we? It's fun. It's exciting. It's something different. And we enjoy getting to pretend to be something else. I love the little boys who pretend to be preacher and put their dad's coat on and the shoes that are way too big. And boy, you talk about hellfire and brimstone, they get that finger shaking. And they'll either tell you what they heard or what they thought they heard or what they heard that somebody else said. <laughs> but they will let you know about it. 
But pretending is something that's very prevalent in our life, isn't it? We pretend about a lot of things. How many pretend we feel good when we don't feel good? You know, people say, how do you feel? And you're like, oh, I'm fine. And you're thinking, I feel so bad. I just don't want to even be here. But we have to smile. We have to turn it on and be what people expect us to be. But sometimes it's just pretending. As I read the scripture for the week and I was thinking about the Ten Commandments, do we have to pretend to follow the Ten Commandments? I mean, pretty much the Ten Commandments, there's a few in there that we have to struggle with, but a lot of them, I mean, none of us murdered anybody this week, did we? I hope not. Um, Some of us didn't even murder any little flies or gnats or anything like that. Some of us did. But when we look at the Ten Commandments, those are God's rules for us. As we get to the New Testament, then we think about ourselves being saved through grace. And for us to make the way clear, we have to be sure that we're not pretending at what we do. And that's being Christians. Pretending to be something that we're not when we come into this house of God. And not pretending when we go outside of this house. John Wesley, on his trip from England to the United States... He and Charles were sitting, and this horrible storm came up. And back then, you only traveled by boat because we didn't have airplanes at that time. And this horrible storm came up, and the boat was tossing and turning. And Charles and John are in the corner crying, God, save us, save us, save us. But the Moravians were out in the middle of the boat saying, God, take us, take us. And they were singing and praising God. And when all was said and done, John Wesley went to the Moravian pastor. He said, what in the world? Why would you be praising God when we're all surely about to die? He said, because we have faith, we know where we're going. And so we can be joyful no matter what happens to us. We are going to be joyful. We're going to praise God and we're going to lift him up because we know even if we die here, we know where we're going. We don't have to pretend That was one of the first time that John Wesley doubted his faith because he didn't have that much faith, and Charles didn't either. We have people that pretend, that leave their names on the books, the rolls, you know, for forever because that makes them Christian, makes them go to heaven, right? Lori, how many people do we have on the roll? And how many people do we have this morning? Forty. Yeah, so there's a little bit of difference there, right? (laughs) But that name on the roll book is not going to get you into heaven. It's only if we believe in Christ. I had a lady that we were going through the rolls one time, and somebody, another church member said, well, she's a member of the Baptist church. I said, why are you saying that? I said, I just talked to her. I know she's a member here. And the person said, no, on her business thing, it says she's a member of the First Baptist Church in town. I said, well, let me call because something may have happened and I may have missed it. And I called her and I said, you know, I thought you were a member here. She said, I am. I said, but on your business profile, it says you're a member of the First Baptist Church. She said, oh, don't worry about that. She said, I just put that there because I get more business if I'm part of the First Baptist Church because people know it more. And I'm like, really? (laughs) Can you imagine To me, that's being ashamed of your church and where you're from. But she did that to increase her business. When we walk through these doors, we should walk through these doors doors joyfully. We should be happy that we've got to come to church today. How many are here because we had to be here today? I've known people that will go to church on Sunday morning because if they don't, their grandma will whoop them. And... Your grandma would whoop you. (laughs) Some people come because a spouse is here. Some people come out of habit. We're just used to going. But how many of us came in this morning with as much excitement as if we were going to go see our favorite sporting event? I hope some people did. (laughs) It's exciting to be at church. It's exciting to see your friends. This is your family. These are the people that support us when we have bad times. These are the people that are going to love us through our bad times. These are the people that are going to lift us up in prayer, that will hold our hands when we laugh and hold our hands when we cry until we laugh until we cry. 
These are our family. And when we leave this place, we should have that much excitement when we leave. Because when we leave this place, we're clearing a path. We're helping people understand how important God is in our life and how important God is to others. We're letting them know that Jesus Christ came and saved us. He made that path, and we're going to follow along behind him, and we're going to do so with excitement. And there's none of the 12 commandments, I don't think, and Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, or Jack will too, I know him. Is there any of the 10 commandments that says, thou shalt not be happy? No! We do our love and joy and peace, and we make sure that people are happy. I got caught one time because being a preacher, you have to always be turned on, so you you know, have to turn that button on sometimes. And one Sunday morning, I'd done two services, and I was tired. I'd been up all night the night before, and I was just exhausted. And one of the churches was having a meal, and I'm in line, and evidently my idol stopped and my button turned off because I was just completely wiped out. And this lady says, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't understand the question. She said, you don't look happy. And I'm thinking, I'm just coasting, trying to get through my day. But her thing was, I didn't look the way I normally looked because I didn't look happy. I worked with a guy, and the kids nicknamed him Eeyore. And everywhere he went, do y'all know who Eeyore is on Winnie the Pooh? Eeyore always has a bad attitude. Oh, bother. You know, everything's bad. The sky is falling. Everything is wrong. And this guy would do this. And during Lent, he would fast. And a couple of three times a month, everybody in the office would get together and we'd go eat lunch together. And we'd ask him, you know, Alan, do you want to go with us? (sighs) I'm fasting. I can't go eat. I'll just sit here and pray. I'll see y'all when you get back. And I'm thinking, really? No. One, we're not supposed to tell people. And two, we're supposed to be joyful. This is time you get to spend with Jesus. This is time you get to talk to God. This should be something that makes you happy. But instead, it was that, oh, bother I've got to do this. And you don't got to do it. You do it because you want to do it. I'm a very visual person. And if things are really, really bad for me, what I like to envision is being able to go and sit in God's lap and him put his arms around me and me be able to listen to his heartbeat And no matter what, him to just let me know it's okay. So many people in the world are longing for that. A place that they can crawl up in somebody's lap and just be held and told it's okay and you're okay. When I go to St. Francis Springs, and I am going to get with Brian soon, I promise I'll do this. Um, I've got pictures from St. Francis Springs that I want to share with y'all. But one of... The most beautiful things that I find there is in the mediation room or the meditation room. And you go in and it's a cross that's about this high and it's about this big. And in the center is the world. It has a little globe on it. But the rest of the cross is carved out people. And so you've got all of these people that are clamoring to the cross and all these people trying to get to the cross. Some of them are reaching for it. Some of them are standing still. But I think about the fact that we have so many people out there that are clamoring for something to give them peace. And you've got this world in the middle of it. And some people leave the world to come be with God, and some people don't. But folks, it's up to us to make the path. It's up to us to make the way. When we come to church, do we use it as a social club? Do we use it to make friends just to make sure that we get somewhere? Do we do it because it's a joyful place and for the right reasons? God has called us into service. God has called us to be joyful. God has called us to enjoy the world that he's made. And he's called us to leave here and go out into the world to make a difference. And we can't make a difference if our heart is dark 
or if we're sad. We can't make a difference if we're hateful and mean. We can't make a difference if we're going to be hurtful to other people. And it doesn't mean that, you know, today I'm mad at Pauline, so I'm going to be nasty to Pauline. But the rest of the time, everybody will say, oh, Daniel's so good, Daniel's so good. But I hurt Pauline. So I'm still not doing what God told me to do. Because even if Pauline did something to me to hurt my feelings, that gives me no right to hurt her back. It's our human nature to want to hurt back, isn't it? It's our human nature, especially if somebody hurts our kids or grandkids, we're going to get them back, right? (laughs) But God calls us to be joyful and to love even those, to make the way wide, to make the path ready. Because, y'all, Jesus is coming back. And when he's coming back, when he gets here, he should see us living our lives like he lived it and also enjoy to be sure that people know that this isn't a bad thing. This is a happy thing. This is a joyful thing to be a Christian. And God loves us, and we have somewhere to go for refuge. We have someone to go to for love, and we have a lap that we can crawl up into and be showered with grace and mercy. Amen.